So, hi everyone and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gianluca and welcome to the Distrack webinar series. Today, we're going to spend some time together in which we're going to try to cover the topic of IoT security. So, let's start right away. Um, who am I, actually? I'm Gianluca Varisco, Chief Information Security Officer at Arduino. Um, today, you are very welcome to ask questions throughout the webinar. And if there is time at the end, we will happily answer them for you. If we run out of time, it's not a big deal. We're going to publish the questions and answers on the District like Know-How app. So, um, since around about one year, I'm a Chief Information Security Officer at Arduino, but my background has been around both the public sector and the private sector. So, Recently, I joined the Italian digital team that is a special unit within the Italian government in which we tried to work with the public administration and the public bodies and make them better and simplify the citizen life. And then my background is actually on the infrastructure side, so both infrastructure and security across Rocket Internet, a German venture capital, Red Hat, you might know about it, and Last Minute Group around the tribal industry. Now, back to Arduino. I'm pretty sure and pretty familiar that you know Arduino, so I'm not going to tell you the whole story about Arduino, but I'm going to focus on a, few, on, a key, on a few key things that I believe you need to know this time. Now, Arduino has been historically around makers, so you all know about the maker movement, Arduino involvement in it. And since a while, we've been starting two other business lines. One is the education, that we believe it's really important. And one is the IoT and Pro line. Now, when it comes to the IoT Pro line, that's what we are here for today. So today, I'm going to tell you a bit more on what are the behind the scene activities that we are moving forward with in regards to cybersecurity and IoT security. Now, Arduino historically has been around enabling anyone to innovate by making complex technologies simple to use. That means that you don't need a PhD in IT, electronics, physics to understand the technology, to understand how the tool works and how to understand how to build projects and how to build innovation. So what we do focus on is in unleashing and helping the people in getting things done without having to know all the bits, all the details around electronics and IT. Now, as you all know, and what we're here for today, developing secure and reliable IT applications can be very, very hard. Now, it's down to a couple of reasons that, well, actually more than a couple, but some of the re main reasons that I'm gonna highlight today it's the reason why developing IoT applications and doing IoT securely is very important. At the same time, it's very hard. Now, back to the hardware. Hardware is comprised of nodes, devices, sensors that are often constrained device, require C and C++ firmware skills. They require effective power management and they depend heavily on firmware. So their power management depends heavily on firmware. Then we're gateways, remote connections, SSH device management, how to reach those devices from the internet, from outside your apartment. And then we're back to radio and networks, long range, low power. Now, when it comes to cloud software, and that's where we're getting all together, all of us, it's down to many different languages, protocols, libraries, security standards. Actually, it's a bit of an eximorous because while we have a lot of security standards, we're still, as we are gonna to see today, not down to a predefined or a set of standards that we all adopt. So we're still on our own when it comes to developing IoT, despite the standards that we have out there. Data and persistence, that's really important. We have different data formats that make data manipulation and interpretation difficult. There is no interoperability often between vendors. There is no interoperability even between software. So software A doesn't talk to software B. And that's a big problem when it comes to 
the way the data is formatted and the way data is manipulated afterwards. So all this interpretation is made really, really difficult. Now, this is a small fraction, I would say. There are even more these days of last year's IoT landscape. As you can see, the Internet of Things landscape in 2018 was very chaotic, was very fragmented. There are applications in terms of verticals. You've got platforms in terms of horizontally, so software, security, connectivity, analytics, and so on. And we've got building blocks. And, but if you look at this, you are going to see that there are so many vendors in both the hardware sector and in the software sector that makes everybody's life very complex. Which product shall I choose when I want to develop something? For which reason? And what are the other competitors? It's kind of engagement that we all adopt when starting developing IoT products. But that's where this fragmentation is what makes security very hard. Now, when it comes to the web stack that we were all familiar with and we are all familiar with, I mean, there's the TCP IP model in which the internet and web app stack, it's made up of web applications. There's the data format where it's down to HTML, XML, JSON, so the way data is formatted. There's the application layer around the protocols, so HTTP, DHCP, DNS, TLS, and SSL. The transport layer is pretty straightforward. It's either TCP or UDP. The intern layer, we're talking about IPv4. We finally got IPv6. Oh, well, still work in progress, but we're getting there. We've got IPsec. And then on the network link layer, we've got Ethernet, DSL, ESDN, wireless LAN, and Wi-Fi. But when it comes to the IoT stack, look at the way all the layers become way more complex. So we've got the TCP IP model made up of IoT applications and device management. We've got the data format. You've got binary, you've got JSON, you've got cyber. We've got the application layer that it's way more complex. You can talk MQTT, you can talk XMPP, you can talk MAPQ, QP, sorry, and you can talk CoAP. Now, when it comes to the transport layer, you've got UDP and DTLS. When it's down to the intern layer, you've got IPv6 or six low pan, so low power. And then you have the network link layer with radio and 802.15.4 Mac. Now, it's way more chaotic. It's way more complex. And the attack surface that I wanted to highlight today and identifying the attack surface when it comes to IoT development, it's becoming really complex. There are so many components, so many parts that you need to consider. Let's start from the first, device hardware. So device hardware, it's made up of memory, physical interfaces, ports, sensors, device firmware, signed, unsigned, update verification, and it's really key topics these days, verifying the update during OTA properly. Then we are down to unencrypted files. When it comes to the mobile application, think about your mobile apps, your mobile phone. I mean, that's, that's a completely new attack surface. And it's not one attack, it's not one surface. It's a lot of surfaces around authentication, data and log storage, default passwords, transport and encryption, password security, 2FA or MFA, Touch ID, and excessive, sometimes really excessive collection of person identifiable information and user data. Then it's down to web application. I mean, let's not forget that behind every mobile app, there is always a backend. So the web application, it's made up of front-end and back-end, as you know. The web application comes with an admin interface, default or weak credentials. That's still one of the key and root issues that we have when it comes to security. As simple as it sounds, it's still one of the most problematic ones. Having secure passwords, not reusing the same passwords, and being able to respond when sites get compromised and we don't have to hurry on rotating passwords. If we just instead think about it, if we just instead we use a single password per service and not the same password everywhere. And I know among all of us, 
there are at least half of the people that maybe reuse the same password in one, two, or five, or all of the services that they use. It's just enough that they compromise one service, even third-party service, and that your whole digital life is compromised as well, potentially compromised because of that password usage. Then it's down to web application security, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, cross-site request forgery, brute force protection. So protecting the backend and protecting the front-end, it's becoming really, really important. Actually, it is important. Radio and network communication, it's a completely new attack surface. We've got cellular, Wi-Fi, TCP, IP, NFC, Bluetooth. So there are so many protocols that our devices talk these days. And there is so much surface to cover and protect. Natural services, web services, vendor APIs, custom protocols, unnecessary services exposed to the internet. And I would also add that sometimes out of the box devices connected to the network have just too many services exposed to the internet. So there's also no need to expose those services that potentially end up in uncovering security vulnerabilities and therefore making your devices a danger. Authentication and authorization. So we're talking about, again, default and weak credentials, user roles. So devices that do or don't manage ACLs, password resets, and session expire. So session management within those devices is still very challenging. Now, what is the reason? So each of us, when developing IoT products, have to assess the risks. I do say often that each of us needs to design its own threat model. Because we could try not to exaggerate on being paranoid. So if we have a device and we have a software and we have a web application, we need to model our threats and our risks. We need to understand the risks and try to classify them, not just scream around, oh no, we have just too much. We have our attack surface is so big. We actually need to assess the risks and design and model our threat, threat and, and, and risk analysis. So if you look at the IoT connection chain on the left column, we've got device on hardware and firmware where the ownership is a vendor X. We've got known vulnerabilities with vendor products as a threat. We've got patching process. It's one of the key challenges of security these days, patching devices. So we're, we're in 2019, we're talking about IoT, machine learning, artificial intelligence. But when it comes to security, patch management is still one of the biggest challenge that every one of us still have. Patching devices is really, really problematic and really, really challenging sometimes. Of course, when it comes to mobile application, we have another vendor. So we have different vendors doing different things and potentially with security development lifecycle activities that are different in between each other. So from a mobile application, of course, we do expect our developers that develop securely. Um, web application, of course, um, the same. So our own secure software development lifecycle activities have to be in place. For information and data management, we need to understand how do we store the data, how do we make the transport of, the, of such data secure, and which part, if not at all, is it encrypted? Is it encrypted at rest or during the transport? The channels of the transmission. We need to make sure that we have security guarantees on SLAs with the telcos, because there we might have also challenging in keeping the network stable. When it comes to user authentication and roles, we have to enumerate each role and authorize activities. First of all, I would add that we also need to make sure that our applications have an overview on who's going to get logged in, who did what. So logging the actions is really important. Having visibility around your tools and if somebody performs authorized and unauthorized activity, understanding a bit which role did he authorize or did they authorize with and how did they work through and were they able to perform any kind of an authorized activity. Now, our mission said that is to enable anyone to develop secure IoT applications by making all these technologies, all these hardware components simple to use. Now, 
if you're familiar with Arduino, but let me rephrase, let me actually remind you on the Panini concept that we applied over our boards, boards since a couple of years these days. So our idea is to make sure that you can build something that looks like a Panino. So like a sandwich, you've got the antenna. So if you look at the picture, it's like we've got an antenna, we've got a shield that potentially connects you to serial, canvas, GPS, or environmental shield where you've got sensors on the board. You've got the Arduino Maker board. So the Arduino Maker board comes with different connectivity options that we're gonna cover today. You've got a carrier board, so a proto or relay, and you've got enclosure. So the whole Panini concept puts together a product that could be potentially final product and can be customized and sold and in which, I mean, by which you could use to develop your own products. If you look at the Arduino MKR form factor, it's actually designed for IoT deployment. What we wanted to focus on from day one was certification, that our boards are certified, that we cover a wide range of connectivity options, that we've got a LiPo battery charger in it, that we've got a secure crypto element that it's really important and that I wanna put emphasis on this, that I want really stress on the importance of the secure crypto element that I'm gonna cover shortly. And then we've got the processor, of course, the ARM Cortex 32 bit low power and the standard form factor. Now, said that, the connectivity options that we wanna cover are the ones that you might need to work with on your projects. So, of course, we've got Wi Fi, we've got Sigfox, we've got LoRa, we've got 2G and 3G, we've got narrowband IoT and CAT M1, we've got Wi Fi, and we've got Wi Fi and FPGA. So the idea here is to cover all connectivity options and even add an FPGA product to our portfolio. But it's really important that you are not, so nevertheless the board, I mean, we have different boards that covers the connectivity options that you are gonna work with on your projects. So it's really important these days that those devices that are potentially exposed on the internet at one point or that communicate over internet are really secure from, are really secure and that covers actually all kind of security challenges that we have ahead. Now, if you look at the Arduino new boards, we've got the Arduino Nano family. So we've got the Arduino Nano Every, we've got the Arduino Nano 33 IoT, the BLE with Bluetooth low energy and the BLE Sense with additional sensors actually on, on the board itself. Now, the last change to actually news on the hardware side is that uh, we've got, starting a couple of months ago now, the first Arduino core based on embed. So you can run Arduino on any embed supported platform out of the box. We finally added support for real multi-trading and you've got embed support for Arduino libraries. So that's the revolution. You access Arduino's APIs from embed applications. Now we started supporting two platforms, the Nano 33 BLE and the Nano 33 BLE Sense, and we're gonna add more over the future. Now back to security, that's what we're here for today. Now secure, security for me means, and for the whole organization means, securing every layer. Security of the hardware, security of the software, and data security. Now, the core to the future and the success of IoT, given all the, the things we, you, you, can pro, you can probably hear, from, hear about every day, about how IoT is gonna be risky, how IoT is gonna increase your attack surface, is to make things secure. So we're talking about security of things here. Now, security of things for me means four big pillars, especially when applied to our boards. The device identity, making sure that those devices are original in the sense of those are the devices that aren't being tampered, aren't being modified by third party. Those are devices for which we know they are original boards that haven't been altered. So that's where the anti-tampering topic comes in, making sure that the board haven't been touched and that no components have been altered, added, or removed. 
then it's a topic of key management. We want to make sure that given one of the biggest threats of IoT is the way those devices authenticate. So you usually authenticate to IoT devices with username and passwords, but many vendors actually don't rotate username and passwords. So what you end up with is tons, so billions of devices that use admin as a username and password as a password. So it's really important that we get rid, wherever is possible, of username and passwords. That's why, for instance, we cover the key management topic. We want to make sure that wherever is possible on our boards, we don't use username and password combination, but rather X509 certificates. So think about encrypted, so encryption certificates, so TLS certificates that are way more secure based on a public key keeper, public private key keeper, and where the private key is stored on your board, actually on the secure element of the board, and can't be extracted. But you can actually generate a new public key and use that public key for performing authentication and authorization. We're going to see about this later on. Now, when you look at the transport, it's really important that wherever data goes from A to B, the transport is encrypted and data confidentiality is performed and actually respected. Now, what we consider important is to build security in our products from the start. So we decided to make an investment and add an Arduino MKR each Arduino MKR, so every Arduino MKR boards that we have out there with a crypto owl chip. So we choose the Attic 508-608 from Microchip, and that's what we consider and what we call, actually what the industry calls secure element. So we're gonna use this cryptographic coprocessor with secure hardware-based key storage for storing the keys. So we actually store up to 16 keys on those crypto chips and also for performing high-speed public key algorithms. So you can do elliptic curve algorithms and for signature and as well for Diffie-Hellman. You can also use actually the uh, internal high-quality random number generator. So you've got a physical cryptographic coprocessor for performing and where offload uh, all your cryptographic functions and where you can perform random number generation operations. Now, we do provide TLS support via easy to use libraries. I'm gonna talk in a while about how we did this. So the idea we had in mind was that we wanted to make TLS super simple and we wanted to make something out of our libraries that you could just call and work with without re-implementing uh, the whole actually TLS and SSL stack. So, of course, Arduino IoT Cloud is one of our software products that I really invite you to have a look at. It's our platform where you can control your IoT devices, your Arduino boards, and for, for in which platform we don't authenticate via username and password, but rather X509 certification-based authentication. Now, the security element is that little component that it's becoming really important for us. I mean, having secure elements on board should be, in, my, in our opinion, the de facto for newer boards, for new boards out there. And the secure element is actually a really important component that you can control from our library. Now, as I said, what we use it for, hardware-based key storage, we store certificates or data in it. You have libraries for writing to it, reading to it. You've got hardware support for asymmetric sign verify key agreement that makes cryptographic functions way faster than doing it somewhere else. And then you've got the random number generator as well, that it's really, really important. Now, when it comes to the encryption, like I said, all traffic to and from the Arduino IoT cloud is encrypted using transport layer security. We do authenticate devices using X500 certificates we added initial support for JSON web tokens in the Arduino library. So if you want to use the Arduino MKR boards for connecting to a service that actually relies on JSON web tokens, so the JVT tokens, you can use our Arduino library and work with them very easily. 
Of course, we also did want to cover the lower one communication. So we've got AES 128 for the communication and CMAC for message exchange, which includes encryption and integrity check. So having lower one channel also secured. Now, you're gonna get the slides at the end of this talk, but in, in general, those are projects that are publicly and freely downloadable, available on the internet. So you just go straight to our github.com Arduino libraries repository, and then we've got library for the crypto elements. We've got the full source code for our port of BSSL. It's a tiny implementation of the SSL TLS protocol written in C. And then you've got also the Arduino MQTT client that's able to send and receive MQTT messages using Arduino. Now, as a recap today, um, the hardware-based security is really important for us. So putting security right away in our boards from the beginning. The way devices get connected to the internet, so the way devices get provisioned to platforms, to cloud platforms, the way TLS certificates are installed, used, and actually rotated, refreshed for authentication, and then the encrypted data transfer. Now, I'm talking today about the Arduino IoT Cloud, but you are really, really, really free to go wherever you want in terms of major IoT Cloud providers. So the Arduino IoT Cloud, as I said, lets you authenticate over certificates, but do also support any kind of HTTP REST API or MQTT server for connection. So you've got HTTP, you've got OAuth, you've got JSON, MQTT, TLS, and SSL. And when it comes to cloud providers, we've got covered Microsoft, AWS products, and Google products. So we've got the Arduino cloud provider examples GitHub repository in which you're gonna find ready-made code examples for connecting to major IoT cloud providers. Now, what we want you to make right away out of the box experience is you buy a board and you're able to connect it securely to the cloud, any cloud. So you are free to use any kind of cloud that do support, of course, either SAT-based authentication or JVT tokens or username and password combination. So you can really enroll your board into a lot of cloud providers. The IoT strategy when it comes to the end-to-end -to -end approach that we adapted and we choose is around the, what we call IoT nodes. So the boards that talk GSM or Nair Band IoT, Sigfox, LoRa, BLE, and Wi-Fi. You've got the edge. The edge could be GSM network, Sigfox, the Arduino gateway or edge device, you've got the cloud. So the Arduino cloud itself or third party clouds, it's one of the end where you can push that data to, or also of course, any kind of internet service. So your own internet service that aggregates, ingests this, kind of, this data and then lets you process it at a later stage. When it comes to Arduino create, all the operations that you were familiar with on the desktop ID, so on the desktop editor, are of course also replicated in the web. So you can use the Arduino Create web editor. It's the same as the desktop applications. It's just a web editor where you can write the code and then from your browser, straight to your board, upload the data and upload your sketch if you're familiar with it. So you don't need a desktop editor anymore. You can use right away the Arduino web editor. Then you've got the Arduino project hub that I really invite you to look at. Arduino project hub is where Arduino users, passionate people or just makers or from anyone with, familiar with Arduino or other platforms can go to and upload their projects. So they can show you how to build your first project when it comes to IoT, when it comes to security, when it comes to any kind of actually, we've got pretty a lot of projects covered that covers a lot of segments in the industry as well as just our free time that you might be interested in. And then we've got a device manager. That's really important. A single place where to manage all your Arduino boards, 
or even where to control your Raspberry, for instance, remotely. So we've got the Arduino Device Manager together with the Arduino Create Agent. So it's an agent you can install on your Raspberry. And then from the My Devices section of Arduino Create, you can control remotely uh, your Raspberry. So you can have a look at the CPU, the RAM, the network, the disks. So, and you can do quite some activities around device management. Then of course, I'm gonna skip the Arduino Cloud in which that we talk about, but the Arduino Cloud comes with the idea of integrating all these components and at the same time giving you a platform that you can use for displaying your data so building dashboards out of it and as well as adding rules so imagine you have a greenhouse you can connect the green so the greenhouse collects humidity temperature light sensors and other sensor data and you can push that data either via wi-fi or gsm or via LoRa. you can push that data to our cloud we're going to ingest the data for you and what you, you get out of it, it's simple dashboards that you can just put on a screen and that you can also interact with. So they are not read-only dashboards, but they are bi-directional dashboards in which you can actually control. For instance, uh, relay, you can control toggle, you can control uh, temperature sensors. And so you can do a lot of write operations as well. Now, again, our core values about software and hardware, but especially on the software side these days, is the easy to use and deploy. So everything comes with a wizard. Our wizard-based approach is to simplify the user journey as much as possible. The secure and reliable, it's really important for us to have secure elements right away on the hardware and the highest standard of encryption either on the hardware side or on the library side. So we wanna make sure that our libraries are secure and we wanna make sure that the libraries that you're using are up to the highest standard of encryption. When it comes to the open application protocols, so we want you, we want you to focus on what to do instead of how to do it. So based on open industry protocols, we are using an open application protocol approach and we do generate code automatically for you. Again, our Arduino Cloud core capabilities that I was talking earlier comes with firmware development and code generation, secure device provisioning and management, dashboard development, and third-party public and private cloud integration. So those are the four pillars that we focus on. So you focus on the code generation by writing the code that you want to put on your boards. We help you in securing the device provisioning and management. So controlling that the boards are online, controlling that the boards are getting the latest updates. We do help with dashboard development. So making dashboard, uh, making dashboard that matter. So dashboards out of data that you just ingested. That's what we are helping you with. And then of course, the third party integration for all kinds of cloud providers. And when I'm, when I'm in private cloud integration, and again, it's AWS, Azure, uh, and Google, I do also mention that Arduino IoT Cloud supports web hooks. So if you use services like Google Spreadsheets or EFTT, or potentially any kind of service that relies upon web hooks, that really is web hooks, you can connect the platform to any of those platforms and get the data from the Arduino cloud to your own platform. Now, we couldn't do security actually. We, we, need the, we need the community for doing security. So as a company, we're doing our best. And we do consider the security of our system and products a top priority. But we are also very aware of the fact that no technology is perfect and that working with, this, with the security researcher community across the globe is very, very important and crucial in identifying weaknesses in any technology. So last year, we launched our coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy in which we actually wanted to open a, secure, a channel. So 
we wanted to talk to security researchers. We wanted to hear from them. And we also did want to engage with them in a proactive and secure way, a secure way, but also in a very, in a very friendly way. We actually want to get the best out of, conver of conversation. We, we engage with security researchers every day. And what we wanted is to make them comfortable, so feel comfortable about reporting vulnerabilities that they have discovered and so that we can fix them and keep our information and our customers secure. And this CVD policy, so the Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure Policy, has been announced last year, October. And now, one year later, I'm very happy actually to say to everyone here listening today that we got a lot of engagement from the security researcher community on both the hardware side and the software side. And our approach to uh, actually developing openly, so putting a lot of code that we developed on GitHub made make all these kind of interactions way easier. What we got from security researchers often are pull requests right away on GitHub. So they do contribute to code or they just write to us and then we contribute back with the code. And we are really actually happy to engage with the with the security industry and we're really investing a lot on making our security and our products more robust when it comes to security. Now, that's actually all from today, for today for me. And full recording of today's session will be available on the Distract YouTube page, probably at the end of the day or over the next days, and will be also uploaded onto the Distract know-how platform together with the Q&A that we discussed. Now, I've got one question in the platform, so that's probably a good time now for asking questions. I think we have still five to 10 minutes. So if you have any question, uh, first of all, I want to thank you. Here's my email, here's my Twitter handle, but feel free to write me any, any email or if you have any message for me or my organization, just write me, I will be happy to engage with you. And now I've got a question open. Um, so how are the private key of the certificate on the crypto chip on the board generated? So we've got, I'm gonna also to write, I'm gonna write it as well. We've got um, a wizard in Arduino, IoT platform that lets you actually generate. So we've got a wizard when you enroll your board into the Arduino IoT cloud in which there's a full process, a full procedure for generating the private key and the public key pair and storing the private key on the secure element. So you just have to follow the wizard. Now, if you don't use Arduino IoT cloud, you can use the examples that we do provide on the on the ECC on actually on the Arduino IoT Cloud library. So we have a sketch that you can use for locking unlocking the slot on the secure element, and um, and then you can work with it on generating the keeper. There's also command line. Um, probably the best, Martino, is just reach out to me over email, and I will provide you the old example codes that you need. Now, when it comes to the OTA updates, we as a company are really working with this, Christer. So we've got this in the roadmap. We are probably releasing something next year. I hope so. And OTA is, of course, very important to us. It's a request that we're getting from customers. And it's also really hard to do, I will be very honest. So we're still working the latest beats around OTA updates, but we're getting there. Yeah. 
I will I'll probably think that the PPT file, so the PowerPoint will be shared by over email as well, Luciano. So that should be covered. Yes, just give me a second and I'll be giving you an example of how to, can, how to use HTTPS with the Arduino device. So just give me an ex a minute. So we've got, a, I hope you can see it. Yeah, we've got a library here on the Wi-Fi 101 SSL client class. And it's a class that allows you to create a client that always connects an SSL to a specified IP address and port. So you can use a simple function, actually a simple method for connecting securely to, yeah, you see, you can connect actually to an HTTPS endpoint and so yeah, we have an SSL client for the Wi-Fi 101 on the maker boards. If you follow up my, with me over email, probably it's way easier, Christian, just to send you some links over the libraries as well, some GitHub examples. Is there any other question from the audience? If not, I wanted to thank you very much for attending today. And again, the full recording will be posted on this Slack YouTube page. So thank you very much for attending and have a good day.